there are some people here now, so I'm going to start talking about this simple game I made. And kind of this is just meant for people who are maybe programmers in other languages like C Sharp or C++ curious about what the experience was like in making a game in Rust. Um, I have made some other stuff in Rust before, um, but all of it is kind of like just pure math where you don't really run into some of the challenges Rust uh, presents um, with its borrow checker. So this is kind of the first like non just pure computation thing that I made. Um, so we're just going to talk about how it went, what were some of the weird things I ran into. Um, so I'll show the game real quick. It's a real simple 2D game. I've got two young kids and I remember some old games like this for like learning to type. Um, I thought it'd be a fun way for them to practice math. All right, so basically you've got this turret down at the bottom, spaceships come down, they've got equations on them. You can target them, you answer the equation, and you shoot them down. All right, if you get it wrong, you know, luck. <clears throat> and as you go, like they, you get more ships, different kinds of ships, you get subtraction, division, multiplication, and so on. And there's levels and stuff. And as you get to new levels, you get new backgrounds. Different, different. And you can back out with the escape key. All right, and quit. And then it's lightly moddable. So in the resources, there's a levels.json file. Um, I'll just open it in here. <clears throat> and you can kind of define how the levels work in here. Um, so what operations which is what ships you get, how fast they go, how many, what's the biggest number and the smallest number that those ships can have, right? So if your kid's super smart, right, you can crank it up and make it hard. And if your kid's new to math, you can make it simpler if the easy level's not easy enough and so on. All right, so pretty basic. Um, some of the things that went really well um, were the, this like levels.json thing. Um, the way I did that is I just define the levels in code, um, right? So I've got a level struct. Each level is made up of a, an array of waves. Um, uh, this, this says what background image is going to be used for that level. The level's got title and then whether it's been unlocked or not, right? Once you beat a level, then you can start from that level next time you play. And then a wave is made up of groups. Each group has a certain type of ship, add, subtract, multiply, etc. Um, certain speed, number, and maximum and minimum, minimum numbers in the equation. And then we have uh, multipliers for the difficulty levels. So you just define the levels once and then the difficulties um, just multiply all of these things by bigger and bigger numbers to make them harder. All right, and so then there's a default level here. Uh, I made a new function that returns an array of levels. <clears throat> and I've just defined the default level in code here. All right, this is just creating structs with all the values I want for each level, right? Level one, level two, level three, and so on. All right, so I wrote the <coughs> default level in code, and then I used a library called um, Saturday. I don't know how to pronounce it. I like to pronounce it Saturday. Um, Saturday is like a general serialization library. So you see I have these tagged as serialized and deserialized. That tells Saturday to, that we're gonna be able to serialize these. And then uh, Saturday has plugins for serializing into different formats. So you could do a, an efficient binary format, or you can do JSON, XML. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, I chose JSON just because people who play this will be able to read it, whether or not they're programmers. Um, so all I did to get the JSON file, I didn't actually type it. I just, um, when the game starts, if you don't already have a levels.json, it will call new and then serialize this to a JSON file, right? So if you um, like screw up your levels.json, right? if you like try to modify it and break it, um, it's no problem because the game will try to load it, fail, and then um, load up the default and then save the default on top of your broken one. So it's fixed. Um, but if you modify it and don't break it, right? like I can make the ships really fast, <coughs> then it loads your changes. So that worked out really well, and I was able to do that like in an hour, right? That whole like 
modifiable levels definition thing uh, with the survey library. So that was really nice and like completely painless. There's nothing, nothing weird that happened um, at all with that. So Saturday is really nice. Uh, it performs really well. It's, it's flexible. That was super cool. Um, the game library I used is called um, GG Easy. I'll pull up its website real quick. This is the GitHub for it. It is just someone's personal project, like hobby project, um, Icefoxen. And it kind of replicates other game frameworks that um, you might have seen in C Sharp or Java, like Monogame or LibGDX. I think it's modeled after the Love framework, um, which I think is Python. <clears throat> so it kind of does the basic things you would expect. Um, it lets you draw textures on the screen, scale them, lets you draw fonts, um, plays sounds, plays music. Um, it's got some basic <clears throat> like vector math operations you can do and stuff. Um, all, all the things you need to like do basic 2D games. Um, it also gives you some access to shaders and stuff like that, but it does not have <clears throat> any built-in support for 3D. So it's kind of kind of 2D only. Um, the only official platforms supported are um, Windows and Linux. Um, I think he says it should work on Mac, might work on WebAssembly one day, might work on iOS. Um, it, it's pretty nice. If you want to like prototype or play around with something or make a really, really simple indie game, um, it's pretty good. Um, if you go beyond that at all, you might want to use something else because it's not totally production ready in every way, right? Like you can't target Android. You can't officially target Mac if you wanted to. Um, there are some bugs, nothing major, but just because it's a hobby project, you know, they're not necessarily going to get fixed unless you fix it yourself. But it was pretty nice to work with. Um, <clears throat> bugs I ran into, um, changing the volume on sounds didn't always work. Um, so I just don't do that. Everything just plays at the default volume. Um, and it's only in certain scenarios. Like you can play things detached. It's like just play the sound effect until it finishes and then don't bother with it anymore. Like setting the volume didn't seem to work. Um, I had trouble with full screen working reliably. Um, so I just don't, I just use a windowed mode, but it's, um, everything's resizable, which is actually kind of hard to do. <clears throat> like no game framework is real good about this. Um, you kind of have to handle resizing on your own. So like the way I wrote this code, everything's positioned as a percentage on the screen. So like X percent and Y percent. Um, and then at the last second, you look at the size of the window and compute the actual pixel positions to get things out. Um, it's got nice support for TTF fonts. Um, like most game libraries, fonts can be tricky. Um, you can't just, like m most game frameworks don't have like a real time GPU based font renderer. Um, so the way it works is when you build up a font, I'll just show an example. Um, where's, where's my new? Yeah, so this, this like when you want to make some words that you're going to draw on the screen, um, you pass in the, the string that you want to draw, what font you want to use, and what size you want to use for the font. And that basically makes a texture of a certain size. And then you can draw that texture on the screen to put your words wherever you want. But um, if you want to make things resizable, um, most fonts don't scale very well, right? Like if you go from here, here it'll look garbage when you, if you make it bigger or make it smaller. Um, so if you want to be able to resize and have fonts look nice, um, you either have to like, anytime there's a resize event, remake your font in an appropriate size for the new screen size, right? So you, you capture the window changed event and then redo your font or pick a font that's really big um, and fat and it'll scale pretty well, which that's what I did here. I just render them once at a pretty big size, like big enough to look good at 1080p. And then because they're big fat fonts, they scale. They scale pretty well. So I'm just scaling the texture down. So I cheated. But it really simplifies your life to do that. 
And then some game frameworks don't even like give you the ability to do the fonts at runtime, only at compile time, but GG Easy lets you do it at runtime. And the other option is there are libraries that will render the fonts like every frame on the GPU really fast. And then resizing is sort of a non-problem at that point. <clears throat> um, let's see. If there's any questions, just feel free to ask things in chat. So the basic way GG Easy works is like a lot of game libraries. Um, you kind of configure it. You give it like a window title, window size, and, and settings and stuff. <clears throat> and then you fire it off. And then the library will call um, draw and update functions at some like uh, either as fast as it can or every time uh, there's a, a vsync event that happens, um, depending how you set it. So this is the draw function that gets called, and this is the update function that gets called. And a lot of game libraries do this. They separate the drawing and updating so that you could, if you wanted to, like update the physics more or less often than you actually draw things if you wanted to. You can, you can decouple those things. You don't have to bother with that. You could like ignore update and just do everything and draw if you wanted to. Like this game would have worked fine like that. Keeping it separate though can be a good way to organize sometimes. Um, so you see here there's a, a match statement, which is like a switch statement in other languages. And it's just kind of going through like a like an enum, right? There's different game states you can be in. You can be at the difficulty selection screen, level selection screen, playing, dying, dead one, etc. And in each case, it just calls an associated update function, right? Update the level select state, draw the level select state, and so on. Um, one hard thing I ran into with the Rust that I mean the fix wasn't so hard, but it's just weird. So if we go to game state. So enums in Rust are actually something called sum types or discriminated unions. So you don't just have like names for each case in your uh, enum. They can also contain data, right? So in this case, the level transition state has a floating point variable and that's used to like count down, right? So this transition lasts like three seconds and the current amount of time left is stored along with the enum. Right, along with this case. And so every time you call update, this gets, you know, you subtract from this until you hit zero. And then you go on from level transition to uh, playing again on the next level. So way down here, <clears throat> when you match, when you say, okay, I have a level transition state, you then get the floating point value out of it like this, you give it a name. So now you have elapsed. But if I tried to pass that directly to draw level transition, the Rust borrow checker, which is what guarantees memory safety at compile time, um, is not happy with it. It actually works now, but it gives you a warning saying that like what you're doing will be an error in the future. So I don't want my code to break in the future. So I restructured it. Um, basically the problem is, is that elapsed is a reference. You see here it says and mute F32. <clears throat> that means it's a, a mutable reference and it's part of um, self here. Like self is my, my game state. It contains all my games, like global state basically. You can think of this as, this is like this in C sharp, right? It's referring to its itself. So because it's part of self and because I'm calling a function on self, if I pass this directly, it's like I've got two mutable references to self at the same time, which is not allowed. Um, but if I do this, then I get a copy of the elapsed float 32. <clears throat> so it's no longer so it's no longer a reference, right? I've dereferenced it and made a copy, and then I pass it, and then it's fine. So like this is an example of like the cost of Rust, right? Like Rust guarantees, oops, that you won't make memory mistakes. Um, and it's fast, but you will occasionally run into stuff like this, which is super weird. You know, you have to get used to this kind of thing. Uh, another example where Rust was hard. Um, so I have my turret struct, right, which represents the gun that's shooting the aliens. And then I've got my aliens, right? And the game keeps track of an array of aliens. I'll go to the game 
state, main state. Um, so we have here, this is a, our vec of aliens. And vec in Rust is just like vector in C++ or like list T in C sharp. It's just a growable array <coughs> of, uh, of aliens. So when you actually shoot an alien, there's a period of time where we're drawing a laser from the turret to the alien and the alien is exploding. And while that's happening, I want the turret to keep rotating, staying targeted on the alien as the alien moves down. So the natural thing, if you're used to object-oriented and garbage-collected languages, is, you know, turret could just have, like, a reference. Um, a reference to an alien, right? Like, it's got a target. This is, you know, if this is... Um, if it's got a target, then we just look up our, our target's position and then orient ourselves towards that, right? Um, so let's actually show you the error, maybe. We'll pull in the alien file. All right, so it says missing lifetime specifier. So this is, again, the Rust borrow checker um, doing stuff you wouldn't expect in other languages. So because we have a reference to some other memory, we kind of have to explicitly tell the compiler um, how long this turret's gonna live to be sure that it doesn't live longer than this reference lives, right? Because if this turret outlives the alien, then we would have a bad uh, reference and Rust won't let, you, won't let you do that. So you have to like first use lifetime parameters to prove that this is okay. And in this case, that was tricky because it's actually, the turret is gonna outlive this alien, um, potentially, right? So, I you know I probably could have used lifetime parameters to make this work this way, but it gets messy, and they kind of propagate. And anything else that holds a turret needs a lifetime parameter. It gets really nasty. So I didn't want to do that. So um, the solution wasn't that complicated. I basically just don't do the targeting inside the turret, right? I just do it in here. Um, update playing. So this is the <clears throat> the main update function when you're playing the game. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, where is the code? Yeah, so the target is part of the main state <clears throat> and it's an option. So we, we match on target to see if there is one. If there is one, it's some. If there's not, it's none. Right, so if we have a target, then we do all of our logic to draw the laser and align the turret to it, right? So you just do things a little differently than you would in uh, an object-oriented language sometimes. And that takes some getting used to, right? Like <clears throat> it's, it's so common if you're doing something like C-sharp to have object, you know, pointers to other objects in your objects all over the place. And in Rust, you kind of have to think about whether that's something you really want to do or not. And there's different approaches to doing that. I also could have um, stored um, the index in to, to the alien and the alien array inside the turret and gotten at the alien that way. Um, but this, this way was pretty simple. <coughs> I'll see, what else came up? Um, a nice, another nice thing about Rust. So let's find some examples here. <clears throat> yeah, so this kind of code here. So I wanted to get, um, so I've got my vec of aliens. Some of them are alive, some of them are dead at any given time. I want to get the one that's lowest on the screen, right? So we need to like go through every alien, see if it's alive. If it's alive, see how far down the screen it is and get the one that is the most far down the screen. Um, and you can do that with iterators. And so this is really similar if you're used to C sharp, like using link, right? You do you do similar kinds of things like with select and filter, select and where, and so on. Um, the nice thing about Rust is you can use these, and it's actually fast. Like this is as fast as if you wrote um, a for loop by hand in C to do the same thing, almost almost always. And in fact, it's actually faster to use iterators in Rust than it is to do a for loop in Rust. 
because um, if you do a for loop, you may get array bounds checks when you access um, the array here because Rust guarantees memory safety, right? So if Rust can't prove that your code's not gonna go outside the bounds of the array, it will insert bounds checks so that you get, you know, your program will stop rather than reading memory it shouldn't. Uh, but when you use iterators, it can always prove that you're not going outside the bounds. So when you use iterators, you get no array bounds checks, so it's actually faster than writing a for loop, which is the opposite of something like C Sharp, or when you can use link, which people find more convenient, um, but it's a lot slower. And in Rust, it's actually faster. And that, that's something I really like, because I do like being able to do things this way sometimes. You avoid off by one errors and stuff. So what this does is it <coughs> gets an iterator from the alien's array. <coughs> Enumerate tells it that you want to get both the index of the alien um, and the alien itself. I'm not actually using the index. Maybe I didn't. I don't need to do that anymore. Um, then I filter. I only get aliens that are not dead, and then I get the maximum alien by its uh, position. And and this chunk I'm doing because floats aren't comparable by default easily. So I'm just multiplying and converting to an int so I can get max more easily. I don't know if this is the best way to do this, but it works. And then, uh, yeah, so then if it if it finds, this will either find the maximum alien or it won't find any aliens, right, if they're all dead. So if it finds one, oh, here, here I'm using the index. So if it finds one, it returns the index to that alien inside an option type. Um, if it doesn't, it returns none. Um, <clears throat> option types are another nice thing about Rust. There's no null pointers in Rust. Um, if you want to have something like a nullable pointer, you use the option type. And the nice thing about the option type is it forces you to check. You can't forget to check if something is null or not. You, you have to explicitly, either explicitly check or explicitly ignore it. And you can ignore it with um, things like unwrap. Like over here, <clears throat> this is where I load all my assets. So anytime you load an image or font, it can fail. So these functions all return a result type, which is like an option, it either succeeds or errors. Um, but if you just, if you want the program to crash, if it can't find its images, um, then you might as well just call unwrap because unwrap will either return the successful result or crash. The program will just stop. All right, so if there's no way to deal with the error gracefully, it's fine to call unwrap. But you have to do this explicitly, right? You can't forget, or the compiler will complain, which is nice. Well, let's see. Anyone have any questions? Any Rust questions or curious about things that were a pain or that were easy? Trying to go through here and think about other things that were a pain or nice. Oh, this was a, a thing that was cool. So I wanted <clears throat> everything to be resizable, right? Um, whether it's text or a texture, right? I want it to all, I, want, I always want to be able to like deal with things in percentages, right? So this image is 10% the width of the screen and located at 0.5.5, which, right, which that would put it in the middle of the screen. Um, so I made this scalable trait, and a trait is like an interface in other languages. <clears throat> so any other type can implement the scalable trait as long as it provides these functions. And some of these functions have default implementations. And so you can have a default implementation as long as the only thing it refers to are other functions in the trait, right? So this like calls percent dimensions, and does some math and returns something. So all my things, like my turret, not the actual image, like the turret, <clears throat> um, implement scalable, right? And the alien implements scalable. And the font, I have my own text type I made that wraps the GGEZ text type, and it implements scalable. And that way I've got like the same set of functions available to position things by percentage and draw them by percentage um, pretty easily. 
So that was a use of, of Rust traits that worked, worked very well. Let's see what else do I have in here? This just lurps between two colors. What do I use this for? Don't even remember. Oh, that's right. So I made uh, the text can be blinkable. Um, that's so you can like uh, on the menus, right? It, it blinks whichever one's active. You know what? I forgot to do that for the difficulty selections. Let's do that. Why isn't difficulty blinking? Let's check it out. So update. Difficulty select. I think it's because I need to update. Yeah, I need to do this for the levels. So <clears throat> I can do a for loop. So we're going through all of our difficulty names. Um, this is like kind of like a for each loop in C sharp, um, and this is our <clears throat> our text object that wraps the GGE text object. So now, if I update it with the amount of time that has passed since the last call to update, it should uh, start blinking. So that's what LERP is for. You give it color one, color two, and then over time, it, it blinks between the two. So this is just going from white to, to gray. Yeah, let me fix the bug. Hello, Eric, how's it going? I assume Eric means the Eric. I know some other Eric's. What else was interesting in the development of this game? <clears throat> oh, so the message the, the messaging system was kind of fun. It was it was pretty easy. So messages are these things that pop up while you're playing. So I wanted to be able to have stuff pop up like uh, when you complete one wave, you complete one wave of right. It says wave eliminated, wave two. Right. You can get these messages that pop up, and there's some others. Um, and like, <clears throat> it's really easy to make a system where that's easy to do. We have our message struct, which just has the the font to draw, and then a duration that it's going to draw for, and then how long it's been drawing for. Right, it update just updates the elapsed, and draw just draws the text, and then over here we have our uh, messages, which is a vec DQ. So you can just push messages onto this um, queue, and they draw until their time is up, and then they're removed from the queue. So anytime you want to flash a message on the screen, you just you just push some text. Um, into there and you're done. You don't have to worry about it. It'll, it'll draw for like three seconds and then fade out again. So that was nice. I, I wrote that early on and, and used it a bunch. You can see here like wave eliminated, next wave. When you go to a new level, it says warp speed. Uh, let's see, so these Background graphics are just static images. Then I've got two um, star fields with alpha, and I just draw one scrolling down the screen faster than the other for the parallax. We've got three lives. We lived. 
most of the art I got from uh, OpenGameArt.com. It's a, a cool website. Oh, it's OpenGameArt.org. So you can search through here, and, and stuff is either like free or like GPL'd. Everything says what license it has. You can look it up and see how you can use it. Um, the fonts I actually bought, because it's hard to find good fonts that are free. I thought the title font was pretty cool. So yeah, overall it went, it went pretty well. I didn't get stuck on Rust Borrow Checker stuff for too long, ever. Um, I think the next thing I work on, I'll probably use, um, just use my own, piece together my own libraries. Like use um, GFX RS for graphics and Rodeo for audio. Um, that way I just got like more control over what happens, right? Like when I ran into the, the bug here where I couldn't make full screen work reliably, there's like nothing I can really do about it. Um, whereas if I was one level lower, I could have I could have fixed fixed it, right? And then it also like <clears throat> you know, a little bit more control over um, being able to do 3D if I want to and, and shaders and so on. See, I'm not sure what the next Rust project will be yet. Got a bunch of ideas, but games are hard and I have a day job, so we'll see. Dealing with input in games is trickier than people realize sometimes. Um, you get events for when keys are released and when they're pressed and whether a key is down or not. <clears throat> like if you just capture whether a key is down or not, stuff will get all screwed up because like someone will tap enter, but you'll actually read that enter being down for like 10 frames in a row and your game will like fly through 10 menus instantaneously, right? So you need to like ignore the repeats or only look at key up events. If you only look at key up events, it feels less responsive because things don't happen as soon as you press the button. They only happen after they release. It kind of feels laggy. So you kind of have to think a lot about how to handle input if you want the game to feel good. Jay asks if I'm using OpenGL. Um, I'm using a, a game library called GGEZ, which behind the scenes will use um, Kind of whatever is best for the platform it's being compiled on so it's going to be using opengl um, or vulcan or directx i'm not sure how it's set up um, it uses an old version of gfx rs behind the scenes so like i'm in linux right now so it's probably using opengl and on windows it's probably using directx but i haven't actually checked um, And I haven't like, you can use shaders with GGEZ, which would get you a little closer to the metal, but I didn't I didn't use any shaders for this. I thought about it, because there's some cool, like you can do shaders that will draw um, pretty cool star fields and nebulas and stuff dynamically, but I didn't want to get into it. I kept the scope really small so I could actually finish. All right, that's about it, unless there's any questions. This game's on, on GitHub, uh, so it's free if you can build it. Pull it over the website. So yeah, you can grab it here, fork it, play with it. Whatever you like. All right, I'll hang around for a little bit in case there's questions, but I'm pretty much done with stuff to talk about, I think. This crosshair is a little image that <coughs> appears on the alien you're targeting. It blinks too. That's why it keeps track of its elapsed time.
There's lots of sounds. Laser sounds, explosion sounds, failure sounds, applause when you beat a, beat a level. This is the asset management system, which is just the one big struct with all the assets. So when you make like a pretty small game, this assets are pretty easy to deal with because you tend just to load all of them when the game starts up and keep all of them around forever. Um, if you do a bigger game, like if you were making Skyrim, right, you can't load everything and keep it loaded. And this all of a sudden becomes like one of the most complicated parts of the game because you have tons of data that has to stream in as the player moves around. And you have to get rid of the old data and it has to be efficient. Um, if you've played Subnautica, which was done with Unity, right, they're having to do that and they're just leaning on a garbage collector, it seems like, um, to deal with it, right? Like they load in new stuff and let the garbage collector clean up the old stuff. And so when you move around real fast in that game, you'll occasionally like get really bad frame rate for a while um, because of the, the garbage collection overhead. So games that do it really well, they have to be really clever. They'll usually kind of allocate a big chunk of memory and, and do their own memory management to stream things in efficiently. But with small indie games, you know, if you're making something like Mario or Braid, usually you can just load everything at startup and keep it, or at least load everything as you load each level and keep it for the whole level and then dump it for the next. But that's why like if you use Unity or um, Unreal Engine, they usually have like a really complicated asset management system, right? Whereas a um, smaller game library, it's just roll your own. It's pretty easy, just load everything. All right, that's all I got. See everybody later.